today's episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom. We'd like to thank our episode sponsor, Celgene Corporation, for their support of Myeloma Crowd Radio. Now, before we begin our show, I'd like to remind everyone that we are launching a new product to help myeloma patients optimize their care, find the best treatment options, find and understand more about clinical trials, um, be able to track their labs if they want to, and be able to see collective reporting about our myeloma experience while at the same time helping myeloma researchers advance a cure for us. And that product is called Health Tree. We are launching that this summer, and we have a 50-plus city tour happening that um, you can go to myelomacrowd.org forward slash health tree and find the locations that we have so far. And you can keep watching that page because we continue to add locations that we'll be coming to over the summer. So watch for that on that page and in our newsletter. And we are so excited about this project. Now, today we have an important show to discuss. We are talking about proteasome inhibitors And in a lot of situations, myeloma patients become resistant to proteasome inhibitors. And I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Mohamed Balyevic at um, a meeting recently, and we started talking about his research, and it became clear that I really wanted to have him on the show. So, Dr. Balyevic, I'm so happy that you're joining us today. We'd like to welcome you to the program. Thank you very much, Annie. It's such a pleasure to be part of your show and communicate to your listeners. Well, let me introduce you before we get started. Um, Dr. Balyevic is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Nebraska. Dr. Balyevic moved to Doha, Qatar on an academic scholarship in 2001 where he completed secondary undergraduate medical education, and he was the first student of that Qatar campus to take a year off of medical studies to por- perform medical research, having worked at the Ansari Center for Stem Cell Therapeutics at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York. So in parallel to his fellowship, he pursued a master's degree in clinical and translational research at the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences University of, at the University of Texas, He's been a recipient of many scholarships, honors, and awards, and most recently the 2014 Celgene Future Leaders in Hematology Award for Clinical Research and the 2015 ASCO AACR Workshop on Methods in Clinical Care Cancer Research. He's contributed to publications in prestigious journals including Nature Medicine, Cancer Cell, the Journal of Clinical Investigation, Circulatory Research, Hematology Oncology Clinics of North America and several chapters by invitation. So, Dr. Balyevic, we're so happy that you're here, and um, let's get started. Well, thank you very much again, Jenny, and please allow me the opportunity to thank you personally for such a wonderful work that you do. Uh, as you mentioned, we had a chance to meet and discuss uh, several important topics uh, when it comes to multiple myeloma and patient care. And... Um, I, uh, it became uh, really clear to me um, uh, the quality of work that you do and the platforms that you are establishing for all of our myeloma patients and the access which they have through those platforms um, is really invaluable. So as a provider, as a physician who focuses on the care of these uh, patients, I, I truly just want to thank you uh, for such an important and wonderful work that you do. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. I, um, My goal is to just help as many patients as possible understand how to get their best care because it really would make hundreds of different or maybe even thousands of years of life with all of us collectively. And so thank you. Of course, certainly. Um, so maybe we begin by you providing an overview of just in general about proteasome inhibitors because some patients may be really familiar with them and some maybe not and why they're such an important class of drugs in myeloma therapy. Of course. <clears throat> well, uh, proteasome inhibitors are really considered the uh, cornerstone medications and drugs that we use in the management of all phases uh, of multiple myeloma virtually in all of our patients, including those who are 
uh, eventually eligible for stem cell transplantation, as well as those who are not eligible for a variety of reasons uh, uh, for stem cell transplantation. Uh, it's really since the introduction of the proteasome inhibitors into clinical practice, and particularly com their combinations with other antimyeloma agents, such as immunomodulatory agents, uh, such as uh, thalidomide, for example, or lenalidomide, that the outcomes for myeloma patients have changed drastically with survivals um, that previously were in only several years, uh, which have now uh, increased to 10 years uh, or more. We are uh, at a particularly exciting time when it comes to multiple myeloma and development of new therapeutic options. And even though that is not the topic of today's discussion, um, development of immune-based therapies uh, uh, is promising to change the landscape and outcome of multiple myeloma patients even more. Uh, when it comes to proteasome inhibitors, um, the first proteasome inhibitor that uh, was approved for use in humans was bortezomib, or Velcade, um, with the mechanism of action that is reversible, uh, and bortezomib in a in in reversible uh, manner inhibits chymotrypsin-like activity of the 26S proteasome uh, subunit, leading to activation of signaling cascades, uh, cell cycle arrest, and apoptosis. It was introduced uh, and FDA approved in 2003 first. Uh, it was subsequently approved for use in myeloma patients with a newly diagnosed uh, disease in 2008, and in 2014 was approved for use in those patients who have been in remission for six months or longer on bortezomib-based therapy. Um, Subsequent to that, we had the development uh, of second-generation proteasome inhibitor, carfilzomib, or kyprolis, and mechanism of action of this proteasome inhibitor uh, is uh, irreversible. So carfilzomib is very potent, selective, irreversible inhibitor of chymotrypsin-like activity of the 20S proteasome subunit. FDA-approved kyprolis, or carfilzomib, in 2012 for use in patients with myeloma who were uh, treated with two prior lines of therapy, including uh, bortezomib and image such as lenalidomide. Um, lastly, uh, we have uh, witnessed the arrival of the first oral proteasome inhibitor in the therapeutic arena for multiple myeloma. The name is ixazomib or ninlaro, and the mechanism of action is reversible. Uh, inhibition of the chymotrypsin-like activity of the beta-5 subunit of the 20S proteasome. Um, as I mentioned, exazomib is really the first oral proteasome inhibitor, and this is particularly exciting because it allowed for um, tailoring of the all oral uh, regimens for myeloma patients. Now, when it comes to uh, some of the similarities or differences between these three uh, proteasome inhibitors. Ixazomib uh, is an oral agent, whereas bortezomib and carfilzomib are administered either subcutaneously in the case of bortezomib or intravenously in the case of carfilzomib. Uh, specifically, bortezomib and ixazomib are peptide boronates, uh, and carfilzomib uh, is epoxy ketone. Uh, peptide boronates work by reversibly inhibiting the beta subunit uh, of the proteasome apparatus, and epoxy ketones, by contrast, irreversibly inhibit the proteasome by covalently bonding to the beta subunits. Uh, exazomib also has more rapid on and rapid off pharmacology that makes it more specific uh, than bortezomib to tumor cells, and as a result, potentially having an improved therapeutic index. Um, the big advantage here of carfilzomib, I might add, um, which, as we mentioned, uh, is irreversible epoxy ketone inhibitor over the boronate-type uh, inhibitors such as bortezomib and ixazomib, uh, appears to be really the potency uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the drug. Of particular note, carfilzomib really only rarely produces neuropathy. So these are just, in general, some of the uh, proteasome inhibitors that we have available to us. There's a number of other 
proteasome inhibitors such as oprosomib, which is another oral agent uh, that are being uh, developed in early phase uh, clinical trials. Mirazomib is another one. It's a beta-lactone inhibitor. These, however, have not garnered FDA approval yet and are still in the investigational stages. And in general, I've heard the proteasome inhibitors described as like a garbage disposal for these proteins. They So they all in general kind of are doing the same thing, but what you're saying is there are three currently approved ones and they, they are different drugs. They're not the same drug. Correct, absolutely. Um, our cells um, really rely on a particular order uh, inside them and uh, Proteasome inhibitors affect the cellular machinery that essentially deals with uh, degraded and misfolded proteins in our cells. Uh, this is a very complex process that happens on a continuous basis, and uh, particular disbalance uh, in the management and folding and sort of cleanup of all of these proteins in the cell can really lead uh, to, uh, in cases of use of these inhibitors, it really leads to accumulation of a variety of these cluttering proteins, which then reaches a critical point um, after which cell receives the signals for apoptosis and cell death uh, because of the disorganized disarray uh, in this aspect. Yeah, so it's it's an important process in the body and in myeloma. It kind of gets tweaked a bit. So. Absolutely, and as I mentioned, um, the proteasome uh, inhibition and the entire uh, uh, system of proteasome uh, uh, chaperones that manage all of these uh, misfolded proteins is really uh, one of the key targets uh, of myeloma therapies, and uh, um, we use proteasome inhibitors in, in all patients uh, at variety of stages, uh, newly diagnosed myeloma, particularly in the relapse refractory setting where we are testing a variety of, of new drugs. Uh, I don't really think that the outcomes of multiple myeloma patients that we are seeing these days would have been possible without the development of uh, this class of medications. Right. I think it's really important that we have these different classes of medications. And the immunotherapies, like you said earlier, are just additive to this. So we could be using kind of everything. Once once we have new drugs in place, it's not necessarily like they'll take the place of some of these drugs. It it might, you know, you might be administering them in different orders and things, but but there it's great to have this type of arsenal against myeloma. Absolutely, and I might add that we are really privileged in in a sense to um have a lot of different therapeutic options available in multiple myeloma for the treatment and management of this disease for all of our patients. If we really take a look at the last 10 to 15 years in terms of regulatory approvals uh, for the new agents, uh, I would add that perhaps only lung cancer rivals the field of multiple myeloma in terms of not just the sheer number of agents that have been approved, but also the classes and different classes of agents, different classes of drugs uh, that are available, that are targeting myeloma from a variety of angles. Uh, myeloma is not really like uh, some other cancers. Uh, myeloma really depends on uh, concomitant targeting uh, and drugging of a variety of uh, spots in the myeloma cells that are responsible for maintaining my myeloma uh, uh, basically life and myeloma replication and the tumor burden. So uh, targeting this disease uh, at the same time, the variety of agents uh, with, uh, which hold a variety of different mechanisms of actions has really been developed as a uh, very important paradigm in this disease. You know, uh, newer immunotherapies uh, and drugs such as Daratuma, for example, have somewhat uh, shifted that paradigm with really groundbreaking results in the single agent setting, and of course we're also witnessing uh, very important uh, responses uh, in the CAR T cell uh, area um, of the immune 
uh, therapies. Uh, nonetheless, uh, at this point in time, really uh, all of our management strategies are relying on combinatorial therapies rather than single-agent therapies in multiple myeloma. Right, and that's because my, so many myeloma patients you know, have so many different types of clones, you're trying to just get it all at the get-go. And Absolutely. So no part of that clone grows up and takes over. Absolutely, In, and this is sometimes confusing to patients because there's a monoclonal uh, term uh, within uh, many sort of uh, different aspects of this disease. And while it certainly uh, explains very well where variety of protein perhaps might be coming, you know, a number of studies over the uh, you know years have really demonstrated that even though a bulk of tumor burden in myeloma is responsible, uh, uh, you know, from a single clone, myeloma indeed uh, is a type of malignancy with variety of different subclones, some uh, which are present in subclinical amounts, uh, and uh, it is really during the therapy and subsequent therapies and the months and years sometimes uh, of management of this disease, that this balance between these different subclones uh, uh, is shifted, and then the uh, clinical behavior uh, of the disease changes, uh, leading to a variety of uh, problems that we encounter, particularly in patients who stop responding to treatments and start developing resistances. And this led us to really start focusing on the area of proteasome inhibitor resistance, Namely because, as we mentioned, proteasome inhibitors are such an important cornerstone of all myeloma therapies, and any effort that we can uh, apply in understanding a variety of different uh, mechanisms of resistance and any strategies that we can develop in uh, curb fighting uh, all those problems can really uh, lead to uh, not only prolonged use of these agents but hopefully improved disease outcomes uh, long term. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, totally. So you mentioned problems with proteasome inhibitor resistance. Is it common, um, I think it's pretty common, for myeloma patients to become resistant at some period? Do you have a, do you have any idea of percentages of how many patients over, over time become resistant? And then also, is resistance consistent across the various proteasome inhibitors? Like, do you get more resistance on, you know, one or the other? Right. Well, you know, it's difficult to say with certainty. However, in some of the available studies have indicated that approximately 70% of myeloma patients are unable to achieve complete or partial remission with single-agent bortezomib uh, induction therapy. You know, this suggests that in these cases, the bulk of the tumor comprises of inherently bortezomib-resistant malignant plasma cells. Um, of course, we don't use uh, bortezomib as, as a single agent in any induction therapy, but nonetheless, you know, this is, uh, uh, development of this drug uh, over the years has, has yielded uh, these very important insights. Um, in terms of uh, resistance uh, being consistent across the various PIs, I wouldn't say so. Uh, you know, we have learned from clinical experience that newer generation proteasome inhibitors such as corfilzomib are more efficacious than the older generation's PI, such as bortezomib. In fact, you know, during the clinical development, uh, and if we look at the regulatory approvals, uh, really the carfilzomib is reserved for situations where uh, patients uh, progress on bortezomib-based therapies. Uh, so um, in some sense, these problems can be considered uh, sequential in nature. However, uh, given the variety of um, different ways that uh, proteasome inhibitor resistance can develop um, and variety of different uh, points in the cellular regulations um, where the proteasome inhibitor resistance can become uh, uh, really a major problem, it really depends, uh, you know, what we're dealing with and also depends uh uh, what type of extrinsic influence, uh, influencers we have, namely uh, the type of therapy that patients are receiving and the selective pressures that variety of therapies are exerting on some of those uh, subpopulations of myeloma cells. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, well, another follow-up question to that, I guess, is um, you mentioned being kind of intrinsically resistant if you're saying only 70% can't 
um, can, can, you know, with a single agent, if you're using a single agent, which, of course, you don't do typically. But it kind of gives you a clue that some people are just resistant from the get-go. So how many patients are are intrinsically resistant versus they require they acquire resistance over time. Well, you that's know, just clinical, kind of my own personal curiosity. <laughs> right, you know, clinical course of multiple myeloma disease itself really teaches us that uh, almost all patients invariably progress on standard uh, regimens that that we uh, treat them with, and uh, bortezomib, for example, is really one of the basic uh, proteasome inhibitors that we use in combination with other drugs in both stem cell eligible and stem cell ineligible, um, stem cell transplant ineligible patients. So this demonstrates to us that the acquired resistance, if it's not present at the beginning, really invariably develops in in, in all patients. Uh, Development of this acquired resistance, you know, is variable, as I mentioned, uh, and dependent on many factors. Some are intrinsic to myeloma cells, and some are external factors, such as, um, you know, uh, type of therapy that we're applying, uh, treatment delays, for example, uh, treatment dosing, you know, uh, uh, of the drugs themselves. Um, The problem here is that there's no clinically validated tool to predict or screen those patients, as you mentioned, who are predicted to have this intrinsic meaning resistance at the beginning of the disease. Uh, to these forms of, of of drugs, and therefore, you know, predisposing these patients to uh, particularly inferior outcomes from the very get-go. So um, this is a challenge at the moment. You know, when we decide to start treatment, uh, we treat everybody empirically uh, with uh, proteasome inhibitors. We have no assay that can tell us. Uh, any particular patient may be predicted to have either inferior response to proteasome inhibitors or may be predicted altogether to be completely resistant. Um, so our treatment strategies and our management strategies do not unfortunately rely at this point in time on any information upfront uh, at the very diagnosis to tell us if we should perhaps adjust the way we treat, uh, uh, you know, a, a variety uh, of, of these patients that are uh, predicted to have intrinsic resistance. Wouldn't that be amazing if that happened? <laughs> I can absolutely. just imagine how much it would just be so fabulous. And absolutely, this is really not just uh, an effort that we're trying to do in multiple myeloma, but if you look across the spectrum of variety of different malignancies, this is really the effort of the 21st century where we are trying to uh, generate uh, tailored patient-specific therapies um, for every patient based on their disease, based on their features, uh, based on their, you know, um, uh, uh, performance status and such. All of these uh, parameters are really essential uh, in our effort to try to treat uh, multiple myeloma uh, in the best way possible from the very diagnosis. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's where I think that's why we wanted to create the cell tree product too is to help identify who's you know, which treatments are working for which patients. And then how do we see that? And that's amazing. Absolutely. Well, and that, let, that's why yeah. I, I mentioned it's so important really the effort that you're doing because this it's very important and we really live in a in a, in a globalized uh, you know, times and society where information is really readily available. Sometimes it can be overwhelming, you know, and we see this all the time with patients who just sometimes um, have too much information to process, and um, it becomes a challenge trying to extract what is valuable, what is useful, and what is applicable at any particular point in time. So, again, right. uh, really the efforts, uh, you know, of, of your platform as well as efforts of, of other groups are really essential in trying to simplify things and point the, point the patients in the right direction and, and point them uh, uh, to focus on the relevant questions with their providers. Right, absolutely. Well, let's talk about a little bit about your research because you have found something that can in, that can kind of indicate something that might be related to proteasome inhibitors. And um, I've read about a little bit about this MUC20 expression. So maybe you want to explain what that is and why it might be a, a good biomarker and um, what its function is. 
Absolutely. And may I add uh, first that this, uh, in fact, is a project that has been started many years ago in the laboratory of Dr. Robert Orlowski uh, at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and I was really just uh, privileged and fortunate to receive training um, and to receive many, many valuable uh, lessons in the care of multiple myeloma patients uh, under the mentorship of Dr. Orlowski during my time at MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center during my fellowship training. And uh, I had the privilege to be able to start working on this project while I was a trainee. Uh, and in fact, this project um, is in some ways still ongoing, in, uh, in even in the basic science realm. Uh, there's a report that's being formulated that's going to become public hopefully very soon that uh, shows the foundations and underpinnings of the clinical project and the clinical trial that uh, we have actually already opened at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. So um, really going many years back, uh, Dr. Lasky and his team um, made an observation through gene expression profiling of carfilzomib-resistant cell lines, uh, as well as protezomib-resistant cell lines, um, uh, that there was a suppressed expression of a member of the mucin gene family, namely MAC20, um, as the most conserved and significant change compared to drug-naive cells. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, the same observation was also made in bortezomib-resistant cell lines as well as crofizomib-resistant cell lines, which were developed. Crucially, uh, suppression of the MET uh, pathway, CMET pathway, um, uh, was observed. And suppression of the MET or ERK signaling restore the sensitivity to proteasome inhibitors. And uh, in this process, MAC20 expression level uh, on the uh, gene expression uh, profiling uh, correlated with greater likelihood of achieving and maintaining a response to bortezomib, which ultimately mm. translated into improved disease-free and overall survival in bortezomib-treated patients. So taken together, these data uh, seem to support um, the use of high expression of MAC20 as a biomarker of proteasome inhibitor sensitivity and of low expression as an indicator of potential resistance. And all of this could possibly uh, uh, be used to overcome uh, this resistance in the clinic uh, uh, by using the combinations of medications uh, with the proteasome inhibitors that could try to exploit uh, this particular uh, lesion in the myeloma cells. Mm -hmm. So MUC20 is that a pro it's a protein, right? Sitting on the surface Cor of myeloma cells. So if you correct, absolutely. Sorry to mean to cut you you know, mm -hmm. MUC20. You know, this is a gene uh, that encodes a member of the mucin protein family. Mucins are high molecular weight glycoproteins that are scattered uh, by many. Uh, pardon me, uh, secreted uh, by many epithelial tissues um, to form insoluble mucus barrier. The C-terminus of this family of member uh, of proteins associates with the multifunctional docking site of the MET proto-oncogene and suppresses activation of some downstream MET signaling cascades. We are reduced uh, HGF activation and ERK12 uh, activation. Uh, it maps to the human chromosome 3. So um, in, in our uh, understanding and our experiments, Really, the MAC20 associates with the CMET pathway, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, and the downstream uh, MAP kinase, TAT3, ALK1, uh, and POMP axis. And it behaves in a way as a stabilizing factor of this CMET pathway, such that when present, the CMET pathway is not active, presumably is not uh, signaling, and therefore is, does not have the chance to participate in the creation of uh, proteasome inhibitor resistance, whereas when it's absent, it releases this uh, signaling and this activation, uh, possibly mm -hmm. uh, you know, explaining why proteasome inhibitor resistance uh, develops in at least a subset of, of myeloma patients. So you're saying when you have these low MUC20 levels, then that affects the CMET pathway, and it just sends a signal like, "Hey, become resistant." So you're seeing the you're seeing the different. I mean, the connection between those two things, right? Uh, correct. You know, MAC20 serves as a stabilizing factor. 
for the entire pathway, which downstream mm-hmm. uh, affects variety of proteins in the in the uh, proteasome chaperone machinery. So uh, when MAC20 is present, uh, it doesn't allow activity of this pathway and doesn't allow variety of these, uh, shall we say, molecular players to be active in creation of the proteasome resistance, uh, proteasome inhibitor mm-hmm. resistance. And when it's, uh, when it's absent, then this pathway is active. You know, it's signaling. It's allowing the uh, variety of these mediators uh, inside myeloma cells to express their function and express their role. And then um, taken all together, uh, uh, the effect that this has on the proteasome chaperone pathway, this leads to uh, resistance to the proteasome inhibitors. So this is an important point, I think, that I'd like to make. Sometimes myeloma is not just what's happening in and on the myeloma cell. It's what's what it's affecting all around it. So in this situation, there are all these different things happening in our body, signals that are sending to, to do things correctly and not to do things correctly. When the wrong signal is sent, then um, things go bad, you know. So... Um, Absolutely, and that's a very important yeah. point that you make because we understand cancer and the entire process of oncogenesis as a very dynamic process and not really isolated process. Uh, cancer interacts with its environment in, in very intimate fashions. Uh, even in the uh, all of the studies that have been done so far over the, over the decades, in, in actually in this entire field, in the in the field of proteasome to resistance, we have actually identified bone marrow microenvironment factors such as IGF-1 activity, AKT or Bruton's tyrosine kinase or MAP kinase pathways uh, or NF-kappa pathway uh, having really essential roles uh, in the development of proteasome to resistance. But as I mentioned, mm-hmm. not just in multiple myeloma, really in all malignancies. So our best efforts in trying to treat and control uh, cancer, uh, in this case multiple myeloma, is really to understand this complex interplay between genetic factors, environmental factors, uh, uh, factors that we're responsible for, such as you know, uh, initiation of therapy, which then provides a selective pressure uh, against clones that are sensitive to that therapy, and then you know, uh, slowly allows for the a growth uh, uh, of those clones that are actually resistant, effectively over time changing the bulk of the tumor uh, from a one that was initially responsive and showed a uh, reduction in, in the disease tumor burden to the one where um, a response uh, then escapes because uh, myeloma cells are now actually uh, completely different than the ones that were at the beginning and we are uh, then required to alter our, our treatment approaches to, to try to control the disease. Right. Myeloma is tricky. So when you talked about the CMED inhibitors, you found a drug that that targeted those inhibitors. So in adding that to carfilzomib, you're working now to overcome resistance. Maybe you want to explain that drug that I don't know how to pronounce it, cabozantinib. Yes, and then how <laughs> how you're working how you're using it with multiple I mean with carfilzomib to try to overcome that resistance. Absolutely. And may I maybe just offer a couple of sentences on really what CMET in you know pathway is altogether. Sure. Um, so the CMET receptor tyrosine kinase mediates the signals for a variety of physiologic processes that have implications in oncogenesis including migration, invasion, cell proliferation, and angiogenesis as well. A wide variety of human cancers exhibit constitutionally dysregulated CMET activity, either through the overexpression of the CMET kinase itself, uh, through activating mutations in the CMET, or through increased uh, what we call autocrine or paracrine secretions of the CMET ligand, uh, uh, HGF. these alterations have strongly been implicated in, in tumor progression and metastasis in variety of cancers. Uh, and high constitutive activation of this CMET uh, pathway has been correlated with poor clinical prognosis. Uh, in myeloma studies, uh, specifically uh, correlating the HGF levels, so HGF is a substance that activates this pathway, the soluble substance. Uh, so um, studies correlating the HGF levels with clinical 
parameters showed that AGF was elevated at diagnosis and serum and marrows of patients, and that AGF levels uh, were elevated in patients with more aggressive disease, correlating with inferior prognosis. Conversely, mm-hmm. declining AGF levels were seen in patients responding to antimyeloma therapies. And patients with low AGF levels were more likely to achieve high-quality responses. Furthermore, reduction of med signaling using some of the um, uh, scientific ways of downregulating the activation of this pathway using small uh, inhibitory RNAs or ribozyme resulted in growth inhibition and apoptosis of myeloma cell lines. So collectively, these findings provided the rationale for the study of CMET inhibitors in myeloma uh, altogether. Cabozantin, Can I ask you? Uh, can let, yes, let me ask you a question ahead. before you move on to cabozantinib. Uh, cabozantinib. I'll I'll say it right by the end of the show. Um, how do you test for? You were saying through gene expression profiling, you were testing for this MUC20. So, is this something that shows up if somebody goes and gets a Skyline DX test or the old MyPRS test? Is that something that shows up on that test, or is there some other way to test for that and the AGF that you were just talking about? If patients kind of wanted to say, well, I want to see if I have higher or lower expression of that, because as a patient, I'm interested in that kind of stuff. Absolutely, you know, and, and you know, you are raising a very salient point here. You know, when it comes specifically to what we are studying right now, namely uh, Mach 20 levels, shall we say, you know, and, and as we mentioned, Mach 20 is really a surface like a protein. There is no validated tool. There is no validated. Uh, um, way of testing for the presence of this protein. However, in during uh, our research efforts uh, over the last several years, we have developed a flow cytometry-based assay that we have used in um, detection of MAC20 levels uh, on myeloma samples from the actual patients. Now, as you alluded to, there are a variety of platforms, variety of tools that are being used these days, the next generation sequencing options. Um, and some of those uh, have really hundreds of genes that are tested at the same time. And with right. embedded within that list of genes are some of these uh, players that are associated with this CMAT pathway uh, that we are involved in right now in terms of uh, testing of this particular hypothesis. But as I mentioned, you know, even even that information is sometimes difficult to uh, clinically utilize, um, except perhaps in the setting where we have clinical trials that are just particularly created to take advantage of some of these molecular lesions with already approved molecular or small molecule uh, inhibitors. Um, and in that context, sometimes patients can make uh, use and take advantage of some of that information to become perhaps candidates uh, for clinical trials of that nature. But in, in multiple myeloma, at this point in time, we are still uh, not using any validated uh, clinical tool or a biomarker, for that matter, uh, that uh, can help us understand who would be predicted to be resistant from the very get-go uh, to mm-hmm. have, you know, in, in, in inferior outcome to the standard of care uh, therapies that we offer to all of our patients, and who would therefore benefit from the frontline adjustment and targeted tailoring right. uh, of the therapy to allow us to actually uh, try to aim for the same type of, you know, good outcomes that we can expect in, in patients who are, you know, very much sensitive uh, to proteasome to proteasome inhibitors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so interesting. I think dividing us all up as patients would be really helpful. Okay, so sorry, I didn't Absolutely. mean to interrupt you about cabozantinib. No problem at all. So cabozantinib uh, is an FDA-approved uh, potent receptor tensing kinase inhibitor that has selectivity against RET, MET, you know, WEGF receptor 1, 2, and 3, and a variety of other uh, targets uh, um, uh, that are very uh, much implicated in a variety of malignancies. So um, it's already FDA approved for the use in thyroid cancer medullary uh, subtype uh, metastatic uh, with the Cometric formulation and uh, recently also received FDA approval for renal cell carcinoma uh, a, with the Cabometics uh, formulation. 
nevertheless, you know, activity has been noted in a variety of different uh, malignancies, such as differentiated thyroid cancer, carcinoid tumors, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, non-small cell lung cancers, hepatocellular carcinomas. I mean, there's a variety of early phase clinical trials that have showed some of this activity and that are still ongoing in a variety of malignancies. As you can imagine, with a variety of different targets that I just uh, named earlier, uh, cabazantinib uh, represents uh, uh, an exciting tool for us to use. On the other hand, it can also represent a challenging drug for tolerance uh, for patients, given that it uh, may have a variety of off-target effects at the same time. Hmm. Well, can you explain how you are thinking about using it with carfilzomib? Absolutely. So um, we are testing uh, the use of cabozantinib. In uh, this case, we're using cabozantinib specifically as a CMAT inhibitor, and we chose to go with it because of its already established role, because of its FDA approval in a variety of malignancies, and because of the abundance of clinical data in the early phase uh, and later phase trials which have demonstrated uh, safety and efficacy in some other cancers. So our effort uh, with the clinical trial that we have opened here at Nebraska and that will very soon also open at MD Anderson Cancer Center is to try and see if we can utilize this knowledge, if we can utilize cabozantinib as a specific CMAT inhibitor to try to see if we can reverse the development of resist, potential resistance, if we can try to resensitize patients who have progressed on proteasome inhibitor corfilzomib, in this case we're focusing on patients who are progressing, progressing on corfilzomib therapy, and if we can demonstrate that uh, we can successfully prolong the use of corfilzomib-based therapies in myeloma patients. We consider this to be very important uh, for a variety of reasons, most of which we have mentioned earlier. PIs are essential uh, cornerstone agents in all myeloma therapies, and uh, prolonging their use uh, would uh, mean a lot to the control of the disease. Myeloma right. is, uh, as we all understand, you know, uh, fortunately for a lot of patients, a type of disease that is really chronic and is disease that, uh, we need uh, very effective agents for control of disease long term. So um, we consider this a very important effort in trying to suppress uh, some of the resistance mechanisms, whether they be intrinsic or, or extrinsic, uh, um, and, and, and trying to basically uh, uh, delay the use of some of these other agents uh, uh, which are reserved perhaps for situations uh, where patients have progressed really on everything that uh, we know works very well and, you know, where we are in a situation where we are having a limited number of treatment options available for disease control. So in mm -hmm. this particular clinical trial, as I mentioned, we are really uh, focusing on patients who have been exposed to at least two but not more than four prior lines of therapy uh, in general, and we're focusing on patients who are, as their last line of therapy, progressing on carfilzomib-based therapy. So whether that is carfilzomib in combination with dexamethasone, a doublet, perhaps for patients who are uh, not as uh, functional and who are perhaps a little bit more frail and can't tolerate uh, triplet combinations, or whether mm -hmm. you know they are on actual triplet combinations such as carfilzomib, revlimid, dexamethasone, or carfilzomib pomalidomide dexamethasone, or carfilzomib cytoxin dexamethasone, et cetera, any form of carfilzomib-based therapy would qualify patients for participation in this clinical trial. Uh, what we would do then is uh, maintain carfilzomib at a, a dose of 27 milligrams per meter squared. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be a fixed dose. And we would also maintain the use of steroids, namely dexamethasone, uh, at a dose of 40 milligrams per week uh, uh, for patients who are 75 or older. That would be reduced to 20 milligrams a week. And um, on top of that uh, base, we would then add cabozantinib at a particular uh, drug level that we would uh, determine to be safe during the phase one portion of this trial. And, and uh, we would try to test whether adding cabozantinib to the cabozomib and dexamethasone could really um, 
prolong the use of carfilzomib uh, in patients with relapsed and refractory myeloma. Mm-hmm. Great. And this is um, a phase one and two study. Can you explain how it's kind of both studies at the same time? And and uh, it's great that you're using a pre-FDA approved drug, in my opinion, because then you just are able to test it kind of in a faster way. Yes, you know, and um, sometimes these things are really of practical nature, too. Um, truth be told, you know, there is a great variety of available cement inhibitors uh, out there, and sometimes investigators are uh, really have to rely on, on drugs that are completely investigational that have never been tested in, in humans before. And uh, we perhaps chose to go with a drug that was, as I mentioned, tested in, in other malignancies, but actually uh, the one that has also been tested in myeloma as well, I might add that uh, there is actually a report of a previous Phase 1B study that was reported in uh, 2016 in, in a blood journal uh, where groups from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and um, um, uh, uh, Harvard uh, Myeloma Program uh, investigators over there tested uh, the use of cabozantinib as a single agent, so as a single drug. Uh, and in their eligibility criteria, they focused including multiple myeloma patients that relapsed uh, or that were refractory after therapy with at least one uh, IMID uh, and one prior proteasome inhibitor uh, drugs. Um, Overall, nine patients were treated uh, in that trial. Median time and therapy was about 61 days, or about two months. And best response uh, for all patients was one patient with minimal response, eight with stable disease, and two with progression of disease. So cabozantinib in this trial didn't have significant single-agent activity in patients with relapsed and refractory myeloma. Uh, unfortunately, AGF levels uh, at the time of the study entry were not available in, in these patients. Therefore, mm-hmm. this study, you know, does not exclude the possibility Hard to track, that right. exactly the cabozantinib may have activity in myeloma patients with higher levels of AGF, you know, where mm-hmm. disease is driven by AGF. Um, our group, uh, um, uh, Dr. Olaski's group, uh, namely, has reported the experience of tivantinib, another CMET inhibitor, in relapsed refractory myeloma. Um, over there, we enrolled 16 patients. And overall, there was uh, evidence of stable disease in four out of 11 patients, which were evaluable for disease response, yielding a disease control rate of about 36%. You know, no patients exhibited uh, partial response or better during that trial. And our analysis suggested uh, the possibility that myeloma cells uh, from our patients were not specifically dependent on HGF and CMET signaling pathway, and that perhaps selected patients with high AGF levels could have benefited a little bit more. So uh, the idea of CMET inhibition is not completely novel in the field of multiple myeloma. However, this type of approach that we are utilizing with this study is in fact novel because through our uh, preclinical studies uh, in a variety of different cell lines and also in animal models, we have learned that in fact Combining this hemat inhibition in addition to proteasome inhibition actually leads uh, to better results. It leads to more uh, cellular deaths uh, uh, in terms of multiple myeloma activity, which is why we specifically designed this study where we would keep the proteasome inhibitors going, where we would keep the, the, the dexamethasone going, and we would add the capozantinib on. Uh, mm. We sincerely hope that perhaps this may yield uh, a different type of uh, responses that has been observed by our colleagues with the previous Phase 1B report and also, uh, you know, from our own report with, with Tivantinib in Realized Refractory Myeloma. So, um, you know, we believe that, um, you know, this is valuable and worthy of investigation. And as you pointed out, by uh, selecting the CMET inhibitor that we already have a sort of a safety profile on defined, you know, we were able to design a study, you know, perhaps with a little bit more awareness of what we could potentially encounter in terms of toxicities with patients. And we were able to take into account a variety of these factors and and, and specifically excluding patients, you know, which would be unsafe uh, to be uh, on a combination of therapy with cabozantinib and and dexamethasone. 
Right, and just an important point for patients, sometimes phase one studies are testing a drug that's never been used before, but sometimes phase one studies are called phase one because they're taking something that has been used in other cancers, like, um, you know, the drug that we're talking about, plus carfilzomib, and they've never really been combined together. So that's why it's exactly. considered a phase, phase one. Exactly, absolutely. You make a very, very good point. In fact, our application to the FDA for the IND was solely based on the fact that cabozantinib uh, had not been previously combined with carfilzomib, even though both carfilzomib and cabozantinib had been studied uh, separately in multiple myeloma. And to go back to your earlier question about, you know, uh, phase one and phase two being combined in the same effort, you know, this is not that uncommon, and this is namely part of the effort... Right to try to gain as much of information as possible uh, as a part of a single effort. Just for your listeners who may not be as familiar with uh, uh, investigational uh, protocols and the purposes of, of, of uh, different phases, uh, phase one a clinical study namely focuses on defining the uh, safety of a drug and defining the safe level of the drug uh, to use in human subjects and in patients such that um, uh, after that safe level of drug is identified, then we can carry on with that knowledge to later phases of the study, namely phase two and phase three. And uh, in the phase two, really, we start asking a question and gaining information about any of the number of disease control parameters, including progression-free survival, depth of response, duration of response, tantinex therapy, overall survival, et cetera, et cetera. So really the phase one portion is the one where we identify what is safe to do, and then in the phase two portion we try to accrue a greater number of patients on that safe uh, drug level so that we can ask a question, how efficacious this is really? Right. Yeah, I think it's great to combine the two because you already have it FDA approved somewhere, so you've already done the safety data for both of these drugs. So I think it's just more efficient. And I do want to point out that this is for people who have failed carfilzomib, so you can join if you have failed that, so it's, it's okay. Uh, yes, exactly. You know, we decided to uh, focus on the patients who are failing on carfilzomib because we wanted to avoid a, a situation where you know, uh, we are testing a, a clinical question in a bortezomib-resistant patients, and uh, where this potentially could then be relevant for bortezomib-resistant patients, but then becomes less relevant in patients who progress on carfilzomib. As you can imagine, the uh, vast majority of myeloma patients, if not all, during the course of their uh, disease uh, and their life with the disease, will be exposed to namely all the medications and all the variety of uh, anti-myeloma drugs that are available to us uh, clinicians and, and uh, subspecialists who treat this disease. So it, it was very important to try to use um, a clinical design which would test this important question in a resistant uh, myeloma situations uh, where patients are progressing on a second-generation proteasome inhibitor and not just the first-generation proteasome inhibitor. Right. So that's important that, that hypothetically you might be able to add this to the others down the road, the other proteasome inhibitors down the road, and maybe it will have the same effect of helping overcome resistance. Yes, and that's that's an interesting you know uh, point to think about and, and will be an important observation uh, to perhaps make in the future uh, with additional studies. You know, even though proteasome inhibitors uh, really... Uh, target the sort of the same machinery, intercellular, you know, chaperone machinery, um, you know, it, there's no guarantee that when you have resistance to one agent that you will necessarily have resistance to other. So uh, these will be important efforts, I would say, uh, at least the starting efforts, in trying to understand whether CMET inhibitor pathway uh, at least is partially responsible for a subset of patients you know, and their uh, resistance to, to PIs. Right. Right. Wonderful. Well, I know I have other questions, but I do want to um, make sure that we have time for any caller questions. So let's do that first, and then I will follow up with my other questions after this. Um, you can call 347-637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad if you have a question. 
and I know it's Memorial Day, <laughs> so a lot of people might be um, by the pool and might be listening to this later. But um, we have our first caller question at five five eight eight one six three. Go ahead with your question. Once, hang on one second. There you go. Okay, go ahead with your question. Hi there, Doctor Believich. Um, thank you for Hello. taking your time out on Memorial Day. Appreciate of course, it. my pleasure. <laughs> Um, I don't, you mentioned there's a drug called cabozantinib, um, and I was wondering, you, you said it had some side effects. I was wondering what those were. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, you know, cabozantinib is this uh, CMET inhibitor in, in question that we are studying uh, in this particular trial. So cabozantinib, as uh, we mentioned earlier, is a uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor that targets variety of uh, targets intracellularly and in the uh, in the myeloma cell, but also in other cells in the body. So a variety of adverse uh, reactions have been observed uh, over time in studying this drug in, in, in many different cancers. So, you know, uh, adverse reactions that are noted in greater than 10% of patients um, uh, have been related to cardiovascular, so hypertension, you know, fatigue, uh, mouse pain, dermatologic uh, side effects, including palmar plantar erythrodysthesia, so skin conditions and, and rashes, um, hematologic uh, side effects, including lower uh, cell counts, neutropenias, thrombocytopenias, reduction in the platelet counts, um, some dysfunctions in the uh, uh, hepatic transaminases as well. Uh, patients who... Um, have previously had fistulas, you know, will not be allowed uh, on on uh, to participate on this trial because of the dangers uh, that this drug would pose in such patients in terms of complications and bleeding. So these are just some of the uh, issues that we are cognizant about uh, when we were designing this study, and uh, it, we will certainly ensure that uh, patients uh, with any of these features you know, who we would potentially be predicted to not have um, uh, the safest experience on this drug will not be part of this trial, but everybody else who reasonably can it will certainly be allowed. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your question. Our next question is 405-4130. Go ahead with your question. Hello? Hello? Yep, Hello. we can hear you. Oh, it's me? Uh, yep. This was a. I, I missed the first part about the. If it's a deletion 13, a uh, 13 chromosome uh, prevents the myeloma from reproducing so uh, quickly, I believe. And uh, there's something to do with IL2 and cytokines. And I just wondered, couldn't we give the patient those substances that would prevent uh, the cells from reproducing, or I'm completely off track? Well, uh, thank you very much for your question. We are certainly using a variety of information available to us from the basic science laboratory bench, uh, including those that we gain in the clinical arena from our patients. You know, and in, in multiple myeloma uh, armamentarium, we're trying to focus on variety of directions and variety of agents that uh, have effect against myeloma either through direct inhibition of, for example, in this case, we're talking about proteasome inhibitors. But as you pointed out, sometimes we're trying to focus um, cytokines or chemokines or a variety of chemicals which have a role to play in uh, cellular proliferation, you know, uh, multiplication of myeloma cells, you know, uh, the place where they home, place where they sit, you know, the microenvironment uh, of the places in the bone marrow and elsewhere you know, uh, with all the factors that are supporting the life and extending the lifespan of the myeloma cells. So you're certainly right in thinking that, you know, uh, we can certainly uh, try to use, utilize a variety of, of um, efforts and mechanisms in trying to suppress, you know, myeloma growth overall. Right. I think I was told by an oncologist that you can't get these substances into the cells to do what a chromosome could make the RNA, the DNA can make the RNA. Uh, just giving those substances is not enough. 
You know, um, cancer in general is, is, as we mentioned, a complicated process. Sometimes uh, cancer specifically depends on one particular lesion or one particular uh, axis that is overactivated. So, for example, a poster child of this type of behavior is chronic myelogenous leukemia with the Philadelphia chromosome activation and the drug that specifically inhibits that exact activity and with dramatic responses, you know, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, cancer control and cancer killing and such. Unfortunately, the vast majority of cancers are not that simple, you know, are not that dependent on only one pathway. And myeloma, certainly, uh, we have a variety of mechanisms that, uh, over time lead to progression of disease from pre-cancerous conditions, you know, that uh, uh, you have heard about, you know, smoldering myeloma, for example, being a precursor condition to symptomatic myeloma, which is a cancerous condition requiring therapy. You know, we are uh, unfortunately dealing with a variety of, of factors that we need to control. So, uh, the better we do that and the safer ways we find of doing that, the better chance we have of ultimately better outcomes for our patients. Well, God bless you for your persistence. God well, bless you too, and hopefully mm-hmm. uh, give you health very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for your call, and thanks for your wonderful responses. Dr. Balyvik, I was going to ask you about your other um, myeloma research, but it looks like we are out of time, so we are going to just have to have you back on the show <laughs> to talk about... It would be my pleasure, really. Thank you very much for the time topics. today. It would be my pleasure to come back. Well, it's a privilege to have you, and thank you so much. We hope you do great things with this study and others. And if you just want to finish up by telling us where it will be open, you mentioned the University of Nebraska is where it's open currently, yes, and it absolutely. will be open at MD Anderson. Do you have any other centers, or are those two the primary? Yes, and unfortunately, this is an investigator-initiated effort uh, with myself and Dr. Orlowski oh, yeah, as yeah. co-principal mm-hmm. investigators on this particular trial. So we have already opened and activated this protocol here at Nebraska, at University of Nebraska Medical Center for our Midwest uh, patients and, and, and broader uh, and we expect that this study will be activated and opened shortly uh, in Houston, Texas, at the Anderson Cancer Center for all of our patients there. Uh, for the time being, we, these are our plans to have this study open at these two sites. Um, uh, but certainly, you know, we hope that uh, if we are able to observe a safety signal uh, in this trial and uh, furthermore, if we're able to validate some of our preclinical hypotheses and clinical hypotheses, then certainly our plan would be to try to open uh, a later phase study uh, with the same concept, and certainly we would aim to try to make this study available across the nation. Great. Well, we we are interested to see what happens with this study, and if you are on carfilzomib and you're interested in the study, um, we will have a link to the study when we post the show, so you'll be able to find it on Spark Cures and follow up and, and go through the steps of participating. So, again, Dr. Bali, would, yeah, no, go ahead. My apologies. Absolutely. I just wanted to mention that I would really welcome uh, any questions from any of your listeners or any patients with multiple myeloma, and I would be happy if you posted my email, you know, and, and would be really uh, uh, happy to respond to any questions or maybe clarify any uh, trial candidacy points and maybe trying to offer some assistance in, in patients who would be interested in perhaps coming from other states and, and participating in this clinical trial. Okay, great. We will include your email in the full show when we um, have the transcript and everything. We're so thankful that you took time out on a holiday, especially to join us. So thank you for um, thank just thank you for all your great work. My pleasure, absolutely, and thank you and all of your patients. Oh, thank you. Listeners. We're happy to happy to have people like you working in the field. <laughs> We're thankful that you, uh, thank you for listening to Myeloma Crowd Radio. And tune in next time to learn more about the latest in myeloma research and what it means for you. 